It is Monday. It's the 28th of July. You're watching Arirang Korea's only global network. Live from Seoul, I'm Moon Gon Young. Now, prosecutors are seeking arrest warrants for Yu Dae Kyun, the eldest son of Yu Byung Un, whose family controlled the Cheongajin Marine Company, which operated the doomed Seolho Ferry, as well as his aid. The 44-year-old son was arrested last Friday, along with 34-year-old Park Soo Kyung, who allegedly helped him avoid being caught. Well, both had been on the police's wanted list since the sinking of the ferry back in April that killed more than 300 people. Prosecutors are also questioning a woman who provided the studio apartment in Yongin where Yu and Park were holed up. They've also summoned Yu's driver and another man who accompanied Yu and Park when they first moved to the studio apartment in late April. Now, the Incheon prosecutor's office wants to detain Yu Dae-gyun for questioning on charges that he embezzled about 9.6 million U.S. dollars from Cheongajin Marine and its affiliates. Now, in other news, Koreans will head to the polls on Wednesday to cast their ballots in the nation's largest ever by-elections. With the uh, clock ticking, candidates from the ruling and opposition parties are doing whatever that they can to get their message across and connect with voters. Our Jim Young-gil has more from the campaign trail. The July 30th polls carry extra weight because 15 parliamentary seats are up for grabs, the largest total ever for a by-election. The stakes are perhaps greatest in this whole and Suwon constituencies, which are considered strategically important as barometers of public sentiment. Candidates of the ruling Henry party have made economic recovery their main platform. They've been touting their party's connection to President Park Geun-hye and promising reforms. There are two choices in this election. Elect our candidates who will bring about economic development for their electoral regions, or their candidates who are mired in collusive practices and old politics. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has also gone on the offensive, deeming the by-election a chance to prompt change. We must provide a warning to the ruling Henry party and the presidential office so that the government brings about changes. The main opposition party has been hammering on the government's failure to arrest Yu byung on the de facto owner of the Seoul Ferry, which sunk in April, killing 304 people. To make them more competitive in races against their conservative rivals, the opposition recently unified campaigns in specific constituencies behind one candidate. The by-election comes less than two months after local elections in June, which neither the ruling nor the main opposition party claimed victory. Jim young Arirang News. Well, we are at the height of the summer vacation season here in Korea, a time when millions of Koreans take a few days off to recharge their batteries. Well, uh, President Park Geun-hye is also taking a week's vacation, although her vacation spot will not be anywhere else but the presidential office of Cheongwa-dae. Officials say she will have a very quiet vacation this year, considering the country is still mourning the victims of April's ferry disaster, and uh, 10 of the passengers to this day remain unaccounted for. The president is expected to continue working on ways to revitalize the economy and decide on who to nominate for the vacant culture minister post. A high-level U.S. official is due in Korea this week to seek support for Washington's sanctions on Russia and Iran. Peter Harrell, the U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in charge of sanctions, is scheduled to meet with Korean officials on Tuesday. Now, he is expected to stress that the international community should work in unison to punish Moscow for assisting pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine, who, of course, have been accused of downing Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 earlier this month. Now, analysts say this situation puts Seoul in a very tough spot. On the one hand, Korea is a uh, very loyal ally of the U.S., but Seoul also needs Moscow's help to deal with the kind of threats posed by North Korea. The U.S. official will also bring his South Korean counterparts up to speed on the international negotiations aimed at curbing Iran's nuclear development program that were recently extended by four months until November. 
It's been a week and a half since Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was shot out of the sky, but officials are still trying to gain full access to the crash site in eastern Ukraine. Well, the progress has been hindered by the pro-Russian rebels blamed for the incident. As our Shin Semin reports, while the global community is weighing its options, a military mission appears to be off the table. Achieving military superiority through an international mission in this area is according to our conclusion, not realistic, not even if we have a massive military buildup. Prime Minister Mark Rutte says the idea of sending international troops to the crash site in rebel-controlled Ukraine is not just unrealistic, but also too risky. While he said all options were on the table, military intervention is apparently not one of them over fears that the development would only stand to broaden the conflict. The area is under control of the separatists, consisting of many heavy armed soldiers at a short distance from the Russian border. They are the same separatists who stand accused of shooting down Flight 17 with nearly 300 people on board. While an earlier deal between Malaysian authorities and the rebels laid the groundwork for an investigation into the disaster, obstructions remain. A team of unarmed Dutch and Australian officers were forced to drop plans to visit the crash site on Sunday due to heavy shelling in the area. More than 200 bodies of the 298 victims in the crash have been recovered. Officials believe the others remain in the plane's wreckage. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. The three weeks of uh, fresh violence in Gaza shows no sign of letting up, with both Hamas and Israel firing on each other despite ceasefire proclamations. The U.S. Security Council has wrapped up an emergency meeting on the growing crisis and called on all parties to lay down their weapons. Our Connie Lee has the details. The UN Security Council has called for an immediate and unconditional humanitarian ceasefire in Gaza to allow for the delivery of urgently needed assistance. The statement comes after an emergency meeting early Monday as military operations resumed in the Gaza Strip despite calls for a truce. Israeli tanks and soldiers are still positioned along the Israeli-Gaza border as talks over a temporary ceasefire broke down. A 24-hour humanitarian truce proposed by Hamas early Sunday to mark the end of the Islamic Ramadan holiday was over by the afternoon, with both sides exchanging fire. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu questioned the validity of the Hamas truce and said his country was not going to let a terrorist organization decide when it's convenient to fire at our cities, at our people, and when it's not. International pressure is on for both parties to resolve the conflict. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and U.N. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon spent last week in the Middle East seeking a peaceful end to the violence. U.S. President Barack Obama also spoke with Netanyahu by phone, calling for an immediate ceasefire. Since the conflict flared up on July 8th, more than 1,000 Palestinians have been killed, mostly civilians, including many women and children. It's a scene of massive destruction, as piles of rubble and debris are seen all around the Gaza Strip, as the conflict shows no sign of letting up. Connie Lee, Adirang News. Meanwhile, a new report claims Hamas militants bought rockets from North Korea in a secret arms deal worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is because uh, the Islamist group needs to top up its depleted weapons after thousands of rockets were either fired at Israel or destroyed in Israeli strikes in recent weeks. Our Sun jung -in reports. Thousands of rockets have been fired since the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas erupted on July 8. And the Islamist group is reportedly keen to replenish its depleted stockpiles. According to the British daily The Telegraph, Hamas militants are attempting to negotiate a new arms deal with North Korea for missiles and communication equipment that will help them continue with their offensive against Israel. The daily, quoting a senior security official, reported that the deal was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. It added that Hamas is now waiting for delivery after it made an initial cash-down payment via a Lebanon-based trading company. The arms deal wouldn't be the first of its kind between the two. 
In 2009, a freighter carrying 35 tons of North Korean arms was seized in Bangkok, which was, according to Western sources, heading to clients such as Hezbollah and Hamas. Meanwhile, Israeli military commanders also believe North Korean experts have given Hamas advice on building their extensive tunnel networks in Gaza. They believe North Korea, which is believed to have one of the world's most sophisticated network of tunnels running beneath the demilitarized zone with South Korea, has helped Hamas improve their own tunnel network. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. When the latest news meets the latest business stories, we give you a bigger and better picture of the world. It's business Today with Moon Gon Yong, every weekday, only on Arirang. Well, the Korea's finance ministry is once again calling for aggressive expansionary policy to revive the sluggish economy. Speaking at an event with journalists on Monday, Che kyung hwan said the expansionary measures were needed now and would likely extend beyond this year. While they echo previous comments he's made since taking office less than two weeks ago, she added that the government and the Bank of Korea are on the same page in their assessments of the current economic situation. Now, there is a growing speculation that the central bank will lower its interest rate next month for the very first time in more than a year. The outstanding bonds from the government's financing have surpassed 5 trillion won. That's about 490 billion U.S. dollars for the first time ever. Now, as of last Thursday, the Korea Financial In Investment Association says the amount of bonds issued by the government this year stood at $95 billion, a 20 percent jump from the same period last year. Now, this means the amount of debt future generations will eventually have to pay in taxes has increased. In the face of the global financial crisis, bonds, uh, bonds issued by the Korean government hiked drastically from 2008 to 2009 from $58 billion to $92 billion. The figure contracted in 2010 by went up in 2011 following the years on crisis and has been on a steady rise since then. Well, in what has become a popular refrain in recent days, uh, the Kospi has yet set another record high. The nation's benchmark index broke the 2050 mark in midday trading, picking right up where it left off last Friday. Arirang News' Kim ji tells us what's behind this latest market rally. Monday was another record-breaking day for the nation's benchmark index. After surpassing the 2050 at one point in midday trading, the Kospi settled in at 2,048 points, picking up its biggest gains in nearly eight months. Kang yeon an analyst at Seoul-based Uri Investment and Securities, says exports played a big part in the rise. Exports this year have reached all-time highs, and company performance has also improved compared to last year. Exports to the U.S. and Europe steadily rose, and exports to China are expected to rise during the July and August period this year. Kang young -gi, an analyst at Seoul-based IM Investment and Securities, attributes the bulk of the rise to low market interest rates. Four major commercial banks in Korea recently lowered interest rates by 0.2 percentage points to 1 percent. When we look at the types of industries leading the gains, they're related to electricity and communications, which benefit from low rates. The two analysts also say the impact of economic plans laid out by the country's new finance minister may have played a role in the record-breaking gains. Last Thursday, the nation's new economic team led by Finance Minister Che kyung hwan unveiled a $40 billion stimulus plan to spur growth by inducing spending and promoting corporate activity. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, moving right along, uh, mainland China is flowing with money that's seeking an investment haven. Now, with a slowing domestic real estate market there, Chinese firms flush with cash are going overseas company shopping. Korea, of course, is no exception when it comes to China's aggressive merge and acquisition moves, as our Song ji Sun reports. Chinese companies are busy buying up overseas companies with their huge cash reserves. According to Bloomberg on Monday, 
Chinese firms spent some 44 billion U.S. dollars on global merger and acquisition deals this year, up nearly 40 percent from a year earlier. Chinese investors have traditionally invested in the domestic real estate market, but with profits eroding amid slowing growth, many are turning to foreign firms for higher gains. And Korea, a close neighbor and home to many advanced IT technologies, is one of the major go-to places for China's investors. Chinese corporate mergers and acquisitions of Korean firms have jumped 27-fold to $661 million this year compared to the same period last year. So what's behind the spike? Well, it's mainly because Asia's biggest internet company, China's Tencent, spent some $500 million buying a 28% share in Korea's CJ Games as it looks to bolster its lineup of online and mobile entertainment. China's IT giants like Tencent, along with Alibaba and Baidu, are fiercely investing in Korean game developers to acquire the skills to invent hit mobile games. On the other hand, Korean firms' investment in Chinese firm through m a stands at a mere $20 million this year, one-fifth of the volume recorded last year. This is raising concerns Korean firms may lose their own shares while the Chinese aggressively acquire Korean stakes. Song j i s o n Arirang News. And back here in Seoul, uh, despite government efforts to promote innovative enterprises, many Korean startups are mom-and-pop stores. Well, according to uh, Global Entrepreneurship Monitor 2013, they accounted for 37% of all startups in Korea last year. Now, a Global Entrepreneurship Monitor is an annual global study conducted by a consortium of universities, and that is the highest percentage among the 26 countries on which the study was conducted. In contrast with countries like Norway and Switzerland, where the proportion was uh, less than 8%. To diversify the startup landscape, industry experts say the government needs to offer a wider range of programs for aspiring entrepreneurs across all age groups so that they, in turn, can create businesses that add value to the economy. Now, um, nowadays, it's really hard to imagine life without all those smart devices. And uh, probably in line with this trend, the number of smartphone users around the world is expected to reach 2.5 billion by the end of next year. That is, according to U.S.-based market researcher Strategy Analytics, uh, and about 35 percent of the global population of approximately 7.2 billion will use smartphones in 2015. Now, that means more than three in every 10 people will be a smartphone user. Industry watchers say the rapid increase in user number can be attributed to the expansion of markets in developing economies where low-end smartphones are being released. According to that market research firm, uh, the number of global users had surpassed 1 billion in 2012. Well, uh, it's no longer news that Korea has become an aging society. And uh, besides the obvious changes in economic structure, what will the trend mean for financial investment? Let's take an in-depth look. Uh, we are joined live in the uh, or on the line by our regular economics contributor, Dr. Kim Byung-ju. Dr. Kim, so uh, there are findings that the aging population fosters a greater conservatism in financial investment. Uh, what are we talking about? Right. Basically, what we see here is the uh, among the fast aging, you know, population here in Korea, we see their tendencies uh, showing clear trend. That is, uh, on the safer side, uh, they're increasing their savings ratio uh, in terms of their uh, financial holdings, and on the other hand, relatively speaking, a little bit riskier side, they're reducing their ratio of uh, holding stocks and bonds. Uh, as you can see on the screen here, basically what we are seeing is uh, the safer side, the savings 
Uh, for the past like three years time between 2010 and 2013, uh, the share of that has increased about more than 4.5% here. And while on the stocks and bonds, the blue side, uh, they are showing uh, more than 2% decrease in terms of their relative size of this financial holdings. And this is, of course, uh, you know, uh, not at all counterintuitive here because many economists have long predicted this kind of tendencies. As you get old as an investor, of course, you want to put your money into more safer side uh, of your uh, portfolio rather than exposing your assets to riskier side of investment here. But the problem is, as we all know, Korea is one of the fastest aging society. We're not, in terms of like at this current point, we're not exactly in the same place as other, uh, some of the European countries and Japan yet, but we know we will fast approaching and even exceeding in terms of size of aging population here in this country uh, in comparison with those countries. So indeed, if uh, that kind of uh, aging trend continues, a lot of people are concerned whether fundamentally speaking, the financial investment pattern in this country may actually change into a much more conservative pattern where a lot of people will be holding even more saving side rather than actively investing in stocks and bonds. Well, uh, Dr. Kim, age, of course, alone cannot explain investors uh, becoming more conservative, I don't think. Would it not be the overall lukewarm uh, performance of stocks and bonds that's also a, uh, a huge contributor to this trend? Right, India, that's a great point, and I'm glad you're pointing that out, because even though, like, today we had a record-breaking day, as has been just reported here, overall, if we look back, as we dealt with this uh, topic a few days ago, you know, for, for the past about seven to eight years, Korea's stock market has been within a, a box uh, movement, uh, showing kind of like not showing any uh, shooting up trend at all, but moving up and down within certain range, as we discussed before. So, the, indeed, this very much disappointing performance of the stock market itself has played a big part in terms of uh, discouraging investors from investing more aggressively and, uh, you know, into uh, relative speaking, more riskier assets for sure. And bonds with this interest rate, uh, you know, for instance, our central bank's target interest rate has been remaining for the past, uh, you know, for some time, 2.5%, which means bond, uh, you know, returns are pretty much lukewarm as well. So, indeed, as you pointed out, this is a two-way interaction. Uh, weak market itself is actually influencing and making uh, the investors uh, less enticed into uh, investing in more riskier, as much as uh, because they're aging, they're becoming conservative on their own. So this is indeed two-way interaction. Well, uh, this uh, diminishing confidence in equity and bond markets, uh, it means a great challenge for the national economy in the longer run, doesn't it? Yeah, indeed. And we, are, we have to say that because we, some of us have uh, like a Japan's case in mind. This is exactly how Japan, ha what Japan has grown been going through for the past several decades because of their fast aging uh, population. And as a result of that, we've been seeing a considerable trend in terms of, uh, you know, seeing the observing the investment trend patterns, you know, getting more into conservative patterns. And as a result of that, a lot of people are saying Japan has lost their momentum for greater innovation. And because people, uh, you know, aging Japanese were putting their money into savings rather than actively investing in financial markets, which could actually identify more promising industries and so on. They're saying that one of the key reasons why Japan's economy has been kind of remaining lukewarm is because of this, uh, you know, conservatism in the, in the financial market. And that's something that we don't want to be repeated here in this, in this country, Korea. So uh, do we have to assume that this trend will continue on? I mean, uh, do we see any possibility for a turnaround? Well, the thing is, uh, the uh, aging side of the population, uh, a lot of economists seem, seems to believe that it will be very difficult to turn around the trend here. But there's one thing we can do, that is uh, somehow making ways, uh, finding ways to make uh, relatively younger investors becoming more robust in terms of like in their investment. Right now, the numbers show that uh, Korea, in Korea, those investors in their 30s actually used to hold about like 62% of them used to have their mutual funds invested. But nowadays, from 62%, uh, last year it went down to 38%, below 40% of the, those Koreans in their 30s are having their money in the mutual 
uh, savings, uh, the, the, the mutual funds of the stocks. So if we can find some ways to encourage these younger people to invest more actively in the stock market and bonds market, some people are saying maybe we'll be uh, able to find some ways to offer a greater boost to the financial market. All right. Well, aging as a society definitely uh, impacts all different sectors of uh, the nation as well as the economy. And we all need to be uh, very cautious about that. Dr. Kim byung ju thank you so much for today. Okay. Thanks. And that is your business today on this Monday. Thank you for watching. Do join us again at 6 p.m. Korea time on Early Edition at 6.